Good morning. How's everybody this morning? <laughs> Lots of smiley faces, I see. You slept well, did you? <laughs> sort of. I thought I'd review just a little bit about uh, osteoarthritis because it's so common that you should be, you have it, yeah. So one in the front row has it, osteoarthritis. Let me get my white chalk. I was doing blue and gold for you, but I think I'll go back to. Versus rheumatoid arthritis. We said this is most common. And we have destruction of the articular cartilage here. And it is triggered initially by trauma or by injury, the same thing, but some people aren't familiar with the term trauma, traumatized trauma or injury induces. And I wanted to make that clear because we learned that with rheumatoid arthritis, this is a default in the immune system. And it's caused by emotional stress, quite different from trauma, different system. And this one then starts with inflammation of the synovial fluid, of synovial membrane. Oh, synovial membrane, sorry. Which causes an increase in synovial fluid. So that's where we get the swelling and here, with the destruction of our articular cartilage, we get extreme pain. And immobility. And the same goes for the rheumatoid arthritis. There is a reduction in the viscosity of the synovial fluid in osteoarthritis. Reduction in viscosity of synovial fluid here. What's viscosity? It's the stickiness of the fluid. But I wanted to make those clear because we were building up to that as you were learning your joints before we continue on with our next subject, which will be cartilage. We've dealt with, does everybody have this? <laughs> Nobody said anything, so I'll take it. So that's Look at cartilage. Oh, let's look at osteoporosis first. One more with bone degeneration. Osteoporosis. So this is loss of bone mass. It 
It's more frequent in females than males. More frequent in females than males. And it's more frequent in whites than in blacks. Now you can begin to think why we should have those differences. How do we prevent it? What's number one? Pardon? Calcium is important, yes. Prevent with calcium and exercise, right. We're just going to, by the time we finish with this course, we're all going to be convinced that we all need an hour of exercise every day. Good exercise to keep fit, right? Good. <laughs> all right, osteoporosis. Let's go on now to cartilage. You could have much more if you want, but basic, one hour. All right, cartilage. We have shown that bone is a connective tissue, right? With cells and fibers and a calcified matrix and lots of blood vessels. Now when we look at cartilage, cartilage is a connective tissue with cells, with fibers, but with a firm pliable matrix. Firm pliable matrix. And what did we say about its blood vessels? No blood vessels, right? So how does it get its nutrients? By diffusion. So what we want to look at first here to get an idea of the kinds of fibers that will be in the cartilage matrix. Got this? No. We have a matrix. We saw that the matrix for bone was a hydroxyapatite, right? What is your matrix for cartilage? It's a glycose amino glycans. So you can see a sugar protein, sugar compound. And it can have fibers several fibers. One type will be collagenous fibers. Collagenous fibers. They have the protein collagen. Protein collagen. Collagen is exceedingly strong. These fibers are strong. In fact, it's been reported that they're as strong as a steel fiber, the same dimension. 
stronger. Strong or stronger than a steel fiber of same dimension. They also have a cross-linking, which helps with their strength. So these fibers, collagenous fibers, are embedded in the matrix. But we have elastic fibers in some matrices. They have a protein elastin, protein elastin. So we can see that it can stretch and recoil, different from our collagenous fibers. Stretch and recoil. So with these basic constituents, let's look at different kinds of cartilage. Kinds and locations. One we've already mentioned, hyaline cartilage, hyaline. And it will have a glassy, shiny appearance. You've all seen it if you've looked in the butcher shop when they have joints in there for soup bones. And you see that white, shiny substance as they show the breakage of the bone. That's hyaline cartilage because you saw it. Now where do we find it? Location? Well, we've given the articular surface, right? Of a joint. Our costal cartilages, which are attaching our ribs to the sternum. That's hyaline cartilage. Whoops, sorry, costal cartilage. Costal, thinking the next thing, costal cart. No, yes, that's what I want, costal cartilage. All right, we have the embryonic skeleton. Your skeleton was once all uh, hyaline cartilage. Embryonic skeleton. And then our respiratory system. It's important that our respiratory system stays open at all times. So you need the difference between your nose and your mouth. You can close your mouth. Who can close his nose without using your fingers? Right? You need hyaline cartilage to keep that open for you to survive. So we're going to see hyaline cartilage in the respiratory system. We'll put the names here, but we'll discuss them in detail when we have the respiratory system later. So under respiratory system, then we'd have the nose, hyaline cartilage to give support. As we go back, we'll have the larynx, the trachea, these are all parts of 
getting the air down to your lungs, the bronchi. All of these are held open by hyaline cartilage. That gives examples of where they're found. The next cartilage then would be elastic cartilage. So the matrix will have elastic fibers. Where are we going to find elastic cartilage? Why do we need a different kind? So location. What's an easy one? That's not an easy one. You can't touch your epiglottis. Outer ear, sure. Wrinkle up your ear. Wrinkle it up. See what happens when you let go. Fortunately, it goes back in shape, doesn't it? <laughs> Did it? <laughs> That's because you have elastic fibers there. So the external ear. Has elastic cartilage. The eustachian tube has elastic cartilage. The eustachian tube. You have to wait until I get through that sentence so I can go on. <laughs> but I know you're eager, so that's fine. What is the eustachian tube? It connects your nasopharynx. You say, where in the world is your nasopharynx? We'll learn about it when we learn the, the passageway for air, but right now it's going to be a name. It's posterior to your nasal cavity. So if you go inside your nose, nasal cavity, back further is the nasopharynx. So the eustachian tube connects the nasopharynx with what? Why do you yawn when you're landing in a plane? To equalize pressure. What are you trying to equalize pressure on? Your tympanic membrane, your eardrum. But to get that air in there, you have to get into the middle ear. So the eustachian tube is connecting the nasopharynx with the middle ear. And we'll learn about it more as we go on, but it's putting it together where you're going to find elastic cartilage to make this tube. And the next one, somebody mentioned a moment ago, is the epiglottis. The epiglottis. Have you ever heard of your epiglottis? What does epi mean? A pawn. Good. You're going to run into that root lots of times. So it's going to be upon the vocal cords. There's, it, with your vocal cords, air has to pass through these membranes. And that area between those membranes is called the glottis. So I'm just going to give it to you now. We'll get it later. But the glottis is the opening between vocal cords. For me to be talking now, air has to pass through my vocal cords. And this epiglottis, in just a quick sketch, is again elastic cartilage. Now, if this is my larynx, And down here, I have folds of membrane, which are my vocal cords. This is ultra simple. But I'll have this sort of leaf of elastic cartilage here. This is the epiglottis. So when you have food in your mouth and it's coming down and it wants to get over here into your esophagus, 
you don't want it to come down into your windpipe or larynx, so the epiglottis comes down as a lid, and that forces the food to go down into the esophagus. So epiglottis in a very simple way. Now, how are you going to remember these? Elastic cartilage begins with what? An E. External ear begins with what? Eustachian tube begins with? <laughs> we are learning. And our epiglottis? This is one thing students never forget are the three places for elastic cartilage, right? What's the third type of cartilage? You've had it. Fibrocartilage, yes, thank you. Some are learning to speak. <clears throat> Fibrocartilage is our third type. And we've reviewed this at least three times before. So we know that we have lots of collagenous fibers. in the matrix of fibrocartilage, thus its name. And where do we find it? What are our examples? Gave you two of them. Intervertebral disc and, you didn't say it loud enough, pubic symphysis, certainly. Intervertebral discs and the Cubic symphysis. What does symphysis mean? Hmm? You don't remember? What's it doing? Bringing together. It's together where the two pubic bones come together. All right, that gives you an introduction to cartilage. But as you get older and you begin to lose it, you'll appreciate your cartilage. So now, how did your bones change from when you were born and you were nothing more than a foot and a half long? And where are you now? 5'10 or 5'8 or 5'4? What allowed your bones to make you grow that way? Terribly important process. Has anybody had the process in other classes? The formation of bones? Well, I think it's, you should have it because it is very important and you just take it for granted. You have all this architectural change going on inside you and you pay no attention to it. So we just want bone formation. There are two types. One, intramembranous. Intramembranous. And intra, just as the name implies, it develops in the connective tissue membrane in the embryo. Develops in the CT membrane in embryo. And what do we call this embryonic connective tissue? Mesenchyme, mesenchyme, mesenchyme. That's embryonic CT. So this method of bone formation is evolutionarily new. So what bone do you think are the last to develop because the structure in it is relatively new within our evolution? Cerebral cortex, right? So the bones of the calvarium, 
develop in connective tissue. So our example here would be the calvarium. Then the other type of bone formation is called endochondral. What is the, where is the root for chondral? What does it mean? Cartilage, yes. So this is our other form of bone formation, endochondral bone formation. So, cartilage. It, with this type, we first have a complete cartilage model of your skeleton. You have a cartilage model of skeleton, and you have to remove that cartilage model to lay down bone. So remove cartilage model to lay down bone. So is bone formed by calcifying cartilage? No. And yet almost every advertisement you see tells you that bone is calcified cartilage. I want all 700 of you to know definitely that bone is not calcified cartilage. You've gotten rid of the cartilage and you lay down bone. Very important. It's amazing how the advertisers never pick that up. So we've got to see how this is going to happen. So we want to see some cartilage model. We can just take any model, but we'll start this will represent our cartilage model. What kind of cartilage is it? Hyaline, Hyaline. process of elimination. You know it's not going to be elastic, and you know it's not fibro. Everything else is hyaline. So a lot of learning is process of elimination, right? So this is our cartilage model. And in our cartilage model, we're going to have what are called ossification centers, centers where bone is going to start forming. Ossification centers. And we'll mark those with an X. We're going to put one here, one here and one here. So these are ossification centers where we're going to remove the cartilage first and start laying down bone. You, it's very systematic because you don't want to remove cartilage haphazardly or your model will collapse and you won't have any structure to the developing embryo. So we call the ends of our cartilage model, the epiphyses. Epiphysis. This is an epiphysis. This is an epiphysis. Who knows what we call the shaft of the bone? The diaphysis, right. Diaphysis. So we'll have first, then, the breakdown of car cartilage in our ossification centers. And then lay down bone. So you'll have a process that's going on from here, for example. We l break down the cartilage, bone is formed. Break down more cartilage, more bone. More bone, and so forth. So we're going in this direction here. And 
And what we'll see then is that you'll have two parts of your bone that will retain cartilage. Two areas retain hyaline cartilage. We're not going to remove the whole model. Who can tell me what one of them that you have in your body right now? Where's your hyaline cartilage in your bone? Sure, the joint, the articular cartilage. That's hyaline cartilage. That's retained. So articular cartilage. So we can put in, once this is becoming a model, a bone, all of it, we're going to retain hyaline cartilage. Now, where's the other place that we have hyaline cartilage? what's called the epiphyseal disc. Epiphyseal disc. Epiphyseal disc. And where is it? It's going to be right in here between the epiphysis and the diaphysis. We will retain hyaline cartilage there for a time. Why is the epiphyseal disc so important? Because this is where the growth of your long bones is occurring. This is where growth of long bones occurs. Now, how does that happen? <clears throat> we have this little model here. It's now bone, except for the cartilage. So to grow in this direction or this direction, we're going to remove cartilage on this side and add cartilage on this side. So we'll move up. We can do it simply this way. Just take the disc out. So here we have a disc. And we're going to be removing the cartilage is degenerating on this side, but on this side it's dividing. So removed here, increased here. So our disc retains its dimension, but it's moving up like this, right? You get the principle? How it keeps its own, the disc stays the same width. Very important principle for you to understand the growth of bones. But in late teens, you stop increasing the dimension and you just remove. So late teens, early 20s,
no new cartilage formed. Only destroyed. So you'll have the diaphysis will just meet with the epiphysis and there's no disc left. So the bone growth has stopped. The literature says somewhere for girls it stops about 18 years of age and for boys stops about 20. But we know that different bones stop at different times, but that's sort of a general average as to where this stops. But it gives the process. And you can see how vulnerable these areas are to us when we're growing. What happens? How We don't even care. You do all these crazy things. And see what would happen if you disrupted your epiphyseal disc. But that didn't happen in any of you. You just went right along, right? So it's a very important part of your body. Now let's look at the structural and functional unit of our compact bone. Bone is dynamic, as you can see. Structural and functional unit of compact bone. So let's just take, to start with, to build up what we mean by compact bone. Here's our bone now. And compact bone is found on the outside. Compact, matrix is all close together. So this equals compact bone. And inside, we have bone with lots of spaces in between called spongy bone. It's really aligned very beautifully with force stresses. When the infant begins to walk, these line up to give the best resistance. So internally, we have spongy bone. What is between the bone here? Use the correct term. What kind of tissue? Pardon? No. We can wait. There was a lady at Stanford who did a study on why students don't answer. We don't wait long enough. So I can wait here. I've given it to you. What's inside your bones? What's happening? Sure, but what do we call that tissue? Scientifically, we gave you the name. What kind of tissue? You're getting there. You've got half the word. Hemopoietic tissue, right. Do you remember it? Hemopoietic tissue. It's important. We repeat, repeat, repeat. Maybe we should just say it once and maybe you'd remember it. Hemopoietic tissue, what is it doing? It's making blood cells, yes. Blood cell production. Remember, we talked about where you could get bone marrow. Somebody asked me that Sunday. They ha we're going to have to give bone marrow transplant. Where to take it? I said, you want to take it in the sternum? You want to take it in the crest of your ileum? Crest of your ileum. There was no doubt in their minds. So this is the basic structure. What we're building up here is to what is compact bone. 
because we're going to look at the structural and functional unit of compact bone. So what we want to do, just to give the principle of how the blood supply is coming in, my staff has brought us all this beautiful new chalk, so we have such choices today. It's wonderful. So we have a blood vessel coming in. It's going to enter the compact bone and then parallel the surface. This is absolutely simplistic, but this is roughly what we want to illustrate. We brought in here a blood vessel and runs parallel to surface. So I'm going to take a cross section through my compact bone. I want to show you the structural unit then of our compact bone. Blessings. So this is our cross section. So we're going to see a blood vessel. We've taken it in cross section. Cross section of compact bone. And we're going to be developing a, a haversion system. Haversion system. Your compact bone has millions of haversion systems. Millions in shaft of bone. We're taking one as a structural and functional unit. And we're first going to see a, an haversion canal with an artery. Haversion canal. It actually has an artery and nerves. And surrounding it then will be these concentric rings of compact bone. These are concentric rings of bone. What do they call them? Lamellae. Lamellae. No, you tried. I appreciate it. You have the spelling. Lamellae. And within this lamellae will be little cavities. Look like little lakes to early anatomists. Just put in a few. These are lacunae. Lacunae. And lacunae have what inside? Osteocytes. Good for you. Osteocytes. So this is where we have our bone maintaining cells. The osteocytes are in here in the lacunae. Thank you. So we've put osteocytes here. They're going to maintain the bone. And then we have to get nutrients to them, so we have to have little canals through the lamellae of bone to reach these lacunae. These are canals for blood. What are you going to call them? So you don't have to say little canal. Canaliculi. 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 So that gives you what we call a haversion system. As I said, there are millions of these in your compact bones. 
and you'll have a vessel coming through perpendicular to the surface. It is a blood vessel in what's called a Volkmann's Canal. I've seen that on board, so I know it's important for you. And it's bringing the blood into your haversion systems. Let's look at slides. Didn't he dim the lights? Yes. I'll wait for you. First slide, please. All right. <laughs> this is cartilage. This is hyaline cartilage with the cells and the matrix. This is part of your respiratory system. You'll learn to identify it. Next one. Next one, please. Next one. <laughs> what kind of cartilage do you think this is? Look at all the fibers. This is elastic cartilage. You can stain and pick up the fibers. What's the next one? And this is fibrocartilage in an intervertebral joint. Look at this. Isn't that beautiful section? Next one. Next one. <laughs> I know we're late. Here's our compact bone cross section and the spongy bone. But you can see how the bone becomes, aligns up to give maximum strength as one begins to walk. In the next one, and this will show some epiphyseal discs here. So this is a hand of a three-year-old child. Ossification is in progress. It's an x-ray of the hand. These haven't even begun down here. But it shows your epiphyseal plate there, active in your phalanges and in your meta metacarpals. In the next one, and this is a section of a cartilage model in the embryo. The cartilage is beginning to dissolve in the middle. It's pretty stable here. But this is the ossification center in the center of the diaphysis. In the next one. And now you can see that cartilage is left here. It's all dissolved out. Bone is being formed, the dark blue. This is cartilage that is beginning to disintegrate. This is healthy cartilage, so the process is moving up here, moving up here from the center of the diaphysis. In the next one, real activity forming at the ossification center in the middle of the diaphysis. Lots of bone coming in. Next one. And these then are the what we call spicules or trabeculae of bone in the um, uh, spongy bone. So we've got lots of marrow forming cells here, but the ones I wanted to show you, we didn't get to them, we'll mention them next time, are osteoclasts. We have osteoblasts, which lay the bone down. We have osteocytes, which maintain the bone. And we have osteoclasts, which destroy the bone. So every time you need some calcium, they'll come and dissolve the bone and release calcium. You get too much calcium out there, more bone is laid down. Constantly, your bones are being remodeled. Osteoclasts are a product of white blood cells. They're macrophages, big eaters. They eat the bone. Next one. And here's another enlargement of an osteoclast. Do you know what hormone activates it? Parathormone, we'll get that later when you need more calcium out in the blood for your muscles and your nerves, osteoclasts release it from the bone. Next one. And this shows your epiphyseal disc. See how clear it is? Your ossification center going on up here in the epiphysis. It's cleared out your whole marrow cavity here. But this will retain dividing on this side 
dissolving on this side. So the disk remains the same dimension. As it moves up, it's got to go feet, right, to make your long bones. Next one. And this is a beautiful slide. This was done here way back in the 40s. Here's the epiphyseal disc, epiphysis. Here's the patella showing the knee joint. Just beautiful. I've never seen one in any collection as good as that. In the next one. And this shows your haversian systems. Here you have the lamellae. Here you have the lacunae with the astrocyte. Here's the artery going up and down. And here's a Volkmann's canal coming in perpendicular uh, to the surface. Volkmann's canal feeds into the artery that is within the haversian canal. Lamellae, lacunae. But see, you have millions of these. And they're in different stages because some of the osteoclasts have destroyed them. Isn't that a beautiful? That's what you look like inside the shaft of your bones. In the next one, and that's sort of a favorite. That was done here. I've never seen a replication of this. Here's your haversian canal. Here are your lacunae. But see, they're empty here. That's why they thought they're little lakes, because when you do the preparation, the cell falls out. Here are your little canicula, canaliculi, bringing nutrients from the center out to the bony cells. But that's going on down in your tibia now, in your fibula. Any bone you mention of a long bone. In the next one, that's it.